everybody. My name is Joshua Vonderheide, and I am the founder of the Percussion Conservatory. And today we're back with another episode of A Percussion Story featuring Mr. Jonathan Wisner. Today's just about getting to know John. John, how are you doing today? Doing great, Josh. Uh, thanks for having me. Um, yeah, I'm just glad to be here. So, perfect, perfect. Well, yeah. we're so happy to have you. And John, obviously, you and I have known each other for many, many years. We go back to, oh my gosh, high school days when we were teenagers running around getting McDonald's at Houston Youth Symphony and just being silly, silly kiddos with a dream. You know, it was, uh, it was a very fun time that we got to know each other. But we're going to go all the way back. We're not even starting at high school. We're going to go way earlier than that, which is a part of this series that I really love and ask you our first question of the day, which is just how did you get started in music at all? What were some of those very first musical experiences and impressions you remember from childhood? Yeah, so I'm, uh, I'm originally from Houston, Texas, um, close to you, obviously. Yeah. And, um, you know, I didn't really grow up in a musical family. Um, my, uh, Actually, you know, no musicians in my family. Uh, my my parents sort of, you know, they got they got a piano for the house, and um, they wanted me and my brother just to take lessons when I was, you know, around pretty young, like first grade, you know, like six years old, just because it would be, you know, be good for us to, you know, learn how to read music. And um, basically, you know, my. Uh, my elementary school had a um, pretty good music program. Um, I just went to, you know, public schools in Houston. And uh, basically, you know, you start off, I think like the first and second grade, you you do like the recorder or the, the flutophone. Right, know? yeah. <laughs> and uh, that's what you, and then when you get to the third grade, which I think is like around eight years old or something, that's when you can join the band like the, the concert band. And um, I remember my, I think the music teacher, I think she kind of wanted me to do the clarinet because I think I was like kind of good at the recorder. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Um, but up. you guys started a yeah, yeah. band in third grade, like when you're yeah. eight? Wow, yeah. that's actually fascinating. I mean, that's if, for yeah, most was... schools around here, like within Houston area, it's, it's not till sixth grade, right? So you actually started quite early yeah, in school. It's pretty amazing. Yeah, it was just, it, it was a school called Lovett Elementary. It was in Meyerland. Okay. Like Southwest Houston. Um and yeah, they had this this really uh, you know, kind of a serious uh band. She was a music teacher, band director. And so basically, you know, when you get to the third grade, you you choose an instrument and um you know, it's, and it's so hard to like, when you're, when you're that young, it's like, why do you make the decisions that you do? You know what I mean? And so, um, and so for some reason, I, I wanted to play drums, you know, I wanted to play percussion. Um, I thought the percussion section just like looked really cool, you know, and, uh, and obviously everyone played the snare drum, but also, you know, you would play the little the little like bells, you know, like the little tiny with like the note names were, you know, those old school transcribed. Like, old yeah. Like instruments. Right. Yeah, exactly. Right. Yeah. So you would, so you play that, you know, you play, I would see, they would play cymbals every now and then like crash cymbals and, and uh, like woodblock for the Christmas concert. Cause my, my brother played trumpet and he was two years older than me. And I would watch, I would go and watch concerts, you know, naturally. And, so yeah, so um, when it was my my turn to pick an instrument, I chose percussion, and uh, and so basically, um, and uh, you know, growing up in Texas, you know, sports is really big, as you know, yeah. and um, you know, I did little league and stuff, and um, you know, I I I still I enjoy sports a lot, and I I love watching sports, but I was never like great at sports. You know, yeah, so the music, but I was you, like, you were finding, yeah, you were finding it. That yeah. And it was like, like, I was your pathway. Yeah. Yeah. And it's like, you know, I think naturally when you're that young, you kind of gravitate towards things that you're like kind of good at, you know? And so, and it was, and it was unique in that, you know, no one, I didn't really know anyone that played music 
and my, you know, seriously. And so it was always, you know, from a young age, it was something that I did because it was kind of my thing, mm -hmm. you know, and, and of course, like, I had no idea that, you know, I would ever be, you know, like a professional or, or you could do this as a career, as a living, like, I had no idea. I never thought it would be possible. Um, so that's really cool. So yeah, that was my, yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah. That, that's a, that's a really <clears throat> early start into this kind of concert world. And I mean, I'm wondering, mm -hmm. did you have a percussion lesson teacher also like from that very early age? Yeah, it was actually the, the, the band, the same band director. I would, I would play for her privately kind of, it wasn't, it'd be like every now and then. Um, and then it, it really wasn't until like middle school, like the sixth grade, uh, I started taking lessons from a guy by the name of Craig, Craig Green, who was a band director in Johnston Middle School, I believe. And he was also, he was a drummer. And he actually, it's kind of interesting, all these really famous jazz drummers from Houston, like study with him at an early age too. So I, I was, I got connected with him and he was kind of, I guess, my first like main, like private teacher. I'd go, I don't know, I don't know how often, like once a week, once every other week, and we would just do, you know. Uh, he taught, you know, he was the one that I played marimba for the first time. You know, he taught me how to play, you know, timpani, and so. What's your first? Very basic. What's that first yeah. four mallet marimba solo, dude? Rain, baby. man. I, Yellow after the rain. No, I didn't. I didn't do four mallet until high school. Okay, cool. I didn't do. I didn't do four mallet until high school. Um, I remember I did a two mallet solo. I think by Hatch, mm -hmm. Earl Hatch. There, that one. I think it's kind of popular. Okay. It's I, wild, I can't, dude. The kids. The name is. We. It's. It's good. It's good that we're all like we've all found our paths. We're all getting employed because these these kids I'm teaching these days they start them on four mallets in sixth grade now. <laughs> yeah, that's. You know, obviously the level keeps going up and up. Yeah, and, it's wild. And um, you know, and back then, you know, I mean, even when we were in high school, like we didn't have like YouTube or. Right. I mean, YouTube may have just been like starting, you know, so we didn't we didn't have nearly the resources. That's right. I was just talking to one of my lessons. People do students. now. And He's in sixth grade, right? He's doing yellow after the rain and he was learning it like a little bit too fast. And I was like, this is like kind of crazy. I was like, how are you learning this so quickly? And I noticed he wasn't really looking at the music too much. He's looking down at his hands. He's got on YouTube, he shows me this video. There's someone who played it with like a GoPro on their head and like played it really slowly and like showing you the point of wow. view, like this is how you play yellow after the rain. And the kid just figured it out. And so, yeah, you're totally right. I mean, the resources have changed immensely from when you and I were, were going through it. I mean, it's, mm -hmm. it's wild. And so you're, you're having this start, you found good teachers from a good age. You were passionate about it from an early age. You were like, no, I don't want to break my ankle in football. What was that transition transition? Like when you're just kind of fascinated with percussion, fascinated with music, moving into high school where I know this about you, you started to get really serious about the art form. So what made that transition happen for you? Yeah, so the high school I went to was, um, it was the, the arts high school or it's called HSPVA. And uh, that was a really big, really, I was, I was, you know, that was a really big moment for me because it was the first time I was around like other people that were like serious about, you know, what they did, you yeah. know, you know, there was, there was orchestra, there was obviously in band and there was also like jazz, there was a big, really good jazz program and, and theater and dance. And it was just like really inspiring just being around for the first time in my life. Like, I feel like it just opened up like a, a world that I had no idea existed, you know what I mean? And so, um, and, you know, and I would, I would hang out with like the jazz guys and we would listen to, you know, Miles records and, and all this cool stuff. And it was like really inspiring. It was like really, and even, even when I started high school, like, it's still like, I, I didn't really know that I was going to do it, like pursue this as a career. It was just like something that was just like, it was like fun, you know, it was like cool. And it was like, you know, we would have a percussion ensemble class. We meet like three, I don't know. I don't know if it was every day or just three times a week, but 
and uh, the percussion teacher, we had a percussion teacher by the name of Patrick Kelly, who uh, he actually went to Rice, studied with Richard Brown, and um, he did more of a, did more of like the freelance scene, you know, like drum set player, um, but he was awesome. You know, he was great, um, really inspiring. And, uh, and basically, and then, and then, uh, that was the first place I, I played an orchestra mm -hmm. was in high school that, at that school. And, um, I knew nothing about orchestral music at all. And I remember, I'll never forget the very first orchestra piece I played on was Dvorak 8. Nice one. And. And uh, I was giving the timpani part, obviously that's the only part there is, but um, I remember like my, that teacher at the time, he was like, you know, just, you know, listen to a recording and, you know, make sure you write in the tuning. And I had no idea what I was doing, but I got a recording and I started listening to it. I'm like, oh my God, it's like, this is amazing. Like that piece still is one of my favorites. Mm -hmm. I'm like, I didn't know this music existed. I didn't know there was timpani writing like this. I ended up playing it. I mean, I don't know how I played it. It was probably really bad, but I remember just like being just, I don't know, I guess like the snake kind of bit me. And I was like, I love this music is amazing, you yeah. know? And I'm like, you know, yeah, like this would be really something really cool to do. You know, if I could do this the rest of my life, that would be amazing. Um, I didn't know how that was going to happen, but that was kind of like the beginning of, you know, of my musical, you know, path, I guess. And then uh, basically, um, I remember it was like my junior year of high school. I was talking to my parents and we we're thinking about college, whether or not I want to do music. And I remember it was like in March, it was like spring break. I flew to New York. I've, we have family there. So I was staying with my family and I contacted uh, Jonathan Haas mm -hmm. at NYU because I, th you know, I think I had his timpani mallets and, uh, you know, NYU is a really good school. And so I, I emailed him and set up a lesson. And um, so I played for him. I don't know what I played. It's probably really bad, but, uh, but he was really nice and really supportive. And at the end of the lesson, he was like, you know, who do you, who do you study with? I said, you know, I studied with this guy kind of a local Houston drummer. And he said, do you know Matt Strauss? I'm like, uh, no, I don't know who he is. He said, you have to study with Matt Strauss right now. I'm like, okay, cool. You know? <laughs> sure. <laughs> okay. So, yeah. So this was like 2008, I think. Okay. Around there. Yeah, that'd be um, like your so, junior year. Junior year. Yeah, so yeah, I think we're in the same we're in the same class, I believe. So, um, and this was like before he taught at Rice. It was like right when Matt was starting to teach at Miami, or or right before. So you know, I was really lucky. I was this young high school kid that didn't really know much, and I contacted Matt, and he he took me in, and that was like, I think that was probably the most important moment you know, of my life, you know, or my, my musical career was getting connected with, with Matt Strauss because, you know, he, he basically taught me everything, you know, and he got me ready for college auditions. And so, you know, I just remember, like, I never had a teacher like that before that had that knowledge. And uh, I remember he would play for me in lessons and I was just so blown away, you know, and it was like, yeah, it was really special. And um, I'm really glad that I got connected with him. You know, he's a very um, special individual. He cares about yeah. his students a lot and he's very invested in their mm -hmm. success. Um, I am curious for <laughs> the audience. I know many things about you, but not everyone does. So that's the whole point of this is that we'd love to hear after studying with Matt and you're talking about getting ready for undergrad auditions. Let's go through now your collegiate experience, you know, your professional development experience where did you go to your undergrad and masters and who did you study with while you were there so i did my undergraduate at university of miami and um i basically continued my studies with 
with Matt because he was teaching there. He would fly. He would fly in like eight times a semester, I believe. So quite a bit. And um, and uh, Svet Stoyanov was the um, excuse me. He was the um, he was basically the head of the program. And uh, so I studied. It was, it was so my undergrad was Svet and Matt, and that was that was you know and. I didn't, I didn't get into all the big, any of the big, you know, conservatories or the big name schools. And, and at the time, Miami was not really known as like this, like, you know, ma amazing, you know, program, I guess, but they, Matt and Sped just started teaching there. And that was probably one of the best schools I could have gone to. I mean, it was, those two were, they're amazing players, amazing teachers. They would play for me in lessons and I learned so much and, and we had an amazing studio, mm -hmm. you know, and, uh, um, and so that's where I did my undergrad. And then I did masters at USC. Um, and that was with Joe Pereira and Jim Baber. Um, and then actually after my first year of masters, I, uh, I won the orchestra now timpani audition. And that was its first year. It's inaugural. Year. So I did that for two years, the orchestra now. Um, and then I went back to USC after that. And, uh, and I finished my master's, did a certificate. Mm -hmm. And then after USC, I went to Colburn and I just finished Colburn. Like it literally, it's actually funny. The day of grad Colburn graduation was the day of Seattle finals. Wow. So, <laughs> so my last day of school and I was in school for kind of a long time, obviously the orchestra now and COVID kind of, kind of prolonged my, my education, right, but right. Um, my last day of school was the day that I won a big job or the day of graduation. So I think that was kind of fitting, I guess. So, it's incredible. so yeah, that's, yeah, yeah that's, that's wild. How did that experience at the orchestra now kind of shape your mindset on the career in percussion that you had chosen um like for kind of what i'm getting at here is was it everything that you thought it would be to be playing in this orchestra every week because that's a very orchestra now is an extremely different experience from school yeah so you know being in a, in a training orchestra i mean it basically if, you know, it feels like you're, you have a job, right? And, um, you know, I was timpani. My first year is just me in the program. I, there wasn't a percussion section. Then my second year, they added one percussionist. But um, yeah, you know, it was, it was a really great experience in that I played a ton of rep and, and we played, you know, concerts all over New York City and up and it was uh, based at Bard College. Mm -hmm. There's a really nice hall uh, designed by Frank Gehry, actually, the same architect that designed Disney Hall. But, um, you know, it was it was definitely a good experience in that I, I played a lot of rap. I played with conductors, you know, guest conductors came in. Um, definitely the challenging thing, and I see a question, I could kind of answer that right now, was... The most challenging thing for me was to not have because I was I was young, you know, I was like 22, I think. Um, you know, I was in my early 20s and it's it's difficult like being on your own. And it's like you're it's great in that it's a training orchestra and you're getting paid, but it's still not like a job and you still need to take auditions. And right, you know, I think not having that that instruction that you get in a school and that sort of structure you know, it's, it's difficult and it was kind of difficult for me. And I, I looking back on it, you know, I, my, I didn't do great in my the auditions that I took during that time. And, and it's cause it's hard. Cause you're, you're, you're working basically, right. you know? Um, and so that was kind of the reason why I went back to USC was to get that instruction again and to, to get in that, to be more focused for auditions mm -hmm. and, you know, so. The yeah. question that that he's answering was asked by Trevor. He's asking, "What made mm -hmm. you decide to go back to school after USC?" So that is, you know, that's a great answer to that question, John. It's just that feeling of 
being part of the community. It's one of the reasons mm. I started Percussion Conservatory, especially during that COVID time. And I'm living in Malaysia, I was very far away. I completely empathize with you of that feeling of just being so far removed from what was my previous nucleus of a percussion community in school. I mean, I had been at Juilliard for six years, super tight knit. Then I was at Rice, which was another really small studio, super tight knit. The whole time mm -hmm. you have a, a mentor that you're seeing every single week coaching you along. And then <laughs> carpet comes out from under you, right? And you have to decide, is this correct for me? You know, am I, is this the right fit for me? Do, am I happy doing this? So one of my questions to follow up on that mm -hmm. was just, you know, throughout this whole process, you were on the circuit for a while, right? I mean, you, you were grinding for a long time and not to put you on the spot or anything, but I'm just <laughs> curious, were there ever times that it was like dark for you? Were there ever times that you were questioning whether this was the right path for you. You were questioning maybe pursuing something else. Was there ever a time that you were feeling like overwhelmed by the whole experience? Because I think it's a pretty common thing. I know I have felt it for sure. You know, it's a pretty common thing in our community. Yeah, of course. And, and you know, and always, you know, I think the toughest thing is, is um, staying positive and, and uh, having that, you know, healthy mindset and, you know, it's easy for those, those, um, those thoughts to creep in, you know, of, of doubt and, and, uh, you know, it's a tough field, you know, and that's just the reality of it. And there's just so few odd openings and auditions and, um, but, you know, I'm, I'm really thankful for, you know, I have amazing parents that, that have always supported me. And, um, you know, I've been around, you know, I have teachers and mentors that have always believed in me and, that stuff matters, you know, and I know it kind of sounds corny, I guess, but, you know, that stuff really does matter, you know, when, when you have people that believe in you, you know, um, but, you know, I think as I got older, you know, and this was like my, I think I tried to count all the auditions I took. And I think, you know, professional auditions, I'm not even including festivals or, or schools. I think this is like my 15th audition mm -hmm. Seattle the one I just won um and uh you know as I get as I got older you know and this is just me but I, I you know I really feel like you know like the excerpts they get easier you know like mm. you know like Porgy gets easier like TG because <laughs> yeah, you know because you, sure. you've yeah. played it so many times and you've yeah. you practice it so many times and you've you know, you made tapes, you've recorded yourself, you, you played it in auditions already in high pressure situations that you've either done well in advance or you didn't do well. And, and then, you know, you know, what you did and, you, you know, you, you, you know, what the, you know, you know how to execute the excerpts, you know, the right tempo and the character. So for me, the, it's not really the, the music it's, it's that, you know, the emotional commitment that it takes, you know, like you, after you get cut from audition and you're, you're trying to, it's like starting the process all over again. Right. You know, like compiling, you know, compiling the excerpt book, you know, you know, doing the score study of the excerpts that you, you never learned before, you know, learning the marimba solo or relearning the marimba solo and, and, you know, doing all the mocks and the lessons and, you know, it's, it's, it's a lot, you know, it takes a lot of energy. And um, so there's that emotional commitment that gets harder as you get older. And also, you know, just the, as you get older, it's just the, the pressure of life, you know, and, and, um, you know, you have to start thinking about paying rent and, <laughs> Have, yeah 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 you know like and, and small it's small thing called yeah yeah and being you know how yeah being yeah. alive you know and and that <laughs> <laughs> you know and yeah, you know i live I in it. southern california and you know rent prices mm. are, are pretty high here but um you know just just the weight of of life and you know it's it's so easy for that to get in the way of your audition preparation one thing that i I tell myself, and I have this poem that I have on my wall over there. 
It's called the man, the man in the glass. I read, I read it all the time. It basically says how, you know, when you look in the mirror, it's like that person, that's the most important person. Right. And and it's all about, you know, believing in yourself. Yeah, I think that that's a really important aspect. I mean, uh, Michael Jackson, right? Man, starting with the man in the mirror. It's a very yeah. similar type. Yeah, of and it's just, it's just about, it's just about, you know, like when you look in the mirror, like, like, are you cool with that person? Are you cool with the decisions that person's made? It's just about, you know, doing your best, you know? And so like every day I just try to do my best. And um, I remember... You know, obviously, when you when you go to the audition, obviously, you want to be a really great musician, um, but you also want to be like the best version of yourself. Right? right. And it's like, and I think sometimes we, we forget about that, you know, and I think that's, it's just like, you know, practicing gratitude and understanding that, you know, if you don't win, like, that's fine, you know, and talk about pressure. I was literally, you know, like I said earlier, I was, I was, this is my last um, I was finished with school, you know, and I was going to do the freelance thing here in LA. I was going to practice at the studio close by. And it was like, you know, that was, it's kind of scary, you know? And, uh, and so obviously, you know, it's easy to, to be like, oh, like if I don't win this audition, like I'm, you know, I'm, you know, what am I going to do? Right. You know, and that, I think that's a really, that's not a great mindset to have because, you know, you need, you know, you, you need the music. I think when you feel good about yourself, that's when the music sounds good, right? Yeah. And you know, so, I'm, in a, I'm in a unique yeah. circumstance in my own life, I feel like, where I'm a person who won a professional audition, played that professional audition for five years, decided to not renew my contract, come back to America, and then still continue percussion but not like actively as an orchestra full-time musician, right? And what I have learned so far in doing that process is that many times I have considered, you know, what are the other things I could be doing with all these mm. skills that I gained uh, through building percussion conservatory through, you know, maybe I could do be a professional video editor or I could host live events or I could be a salesperson or I could do this. And I just, I always come back to percussion because I just fundamentally love it. Like I have just never lost that little, what we talked about at the beginning, like you're, you're in eighth grade, I mean, sorry, you're eight or nine years old and you're just, I want to hit a drum. And I think sometimes throughout this whole process, it can be really difficult to remember that that person was the original person who was the man in the glass, you know, the boy or the girl mm -hmm. in the glass. That was that original person that you were looking at that you, you were so proud of yourself just for exploring, right? And I, I find that in my own life, the people that I have seen go out and do great things in percussion and the people who, you know, getting a professional engagement was really just the first stop for them. It wasn't even, it's just like a, it's just a train station. It's just one more place, one more thing that they're doing. But then they go into teaching and they go into writing music and they go into learning how to be audio engineers and they learn how to go into so many different pathways. And I think if you are out there right now listening to this and you're the type of person who might feel like it's make it or break it orchestra audition, you know, that's not necessarily true. There are a lot of ways to stay in the percussion community, to stay in the classical music community and be an extremely integral vital part of the community without necessarily being a full-time employed orchestra musician. I do want to continue the conversation in a slightly different direction, which is just that, you know, John, you mentioned 15 auditions. Did you notice your preparation process changing, evolving? Uh, you know, you've achieved success at multiple auditions, but they have been very different auditions, you know, auditioning for different roles within the orchestra. What has that audition process been like and what has helped you gain like control over your process? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, every every audition kind of brings its own unique challenges. And mm -hmm. um, I remember the first like big finals I made was... Um, was a national symphony, the assistant timpani audition, the one that Scott Christian won. Mm -hmm. And um, I remember I was, 
I, I can't remember when that was. That was like in 2015 or something or 2016, maybe. I can't remember. So, you know, I was like in my mid 20s or whatever. And, uh, I remember just being lucky to have been invited because I was probably the biggest audition I've ever taken. But I remember like making finals and, um, and uh, I was at USC and I was like, wow, like, I guess, you know, uh, I guess that um, I can do this maybe, yeah. you know, it's like you're in a final, you know, and you see, you know, it was like, you know, Jay Ritchie was there, Joe Bricker and uh, Aaron Dowry, who just won the most recent one and uh, Harrison Honor, who I uh, would do Tingled with. Um, one of my close friends but you know it's like you're around all these like big you know players and it's like wow you know I guess I could I could hang with you know these big guys mm -hmm. but um you know obviously you know the preparation um you know that was assistant timpani uh and you know I, I you know I kind of for a while I thought that I was that was kind of like my I would get land like an assistant timpani job because I did timpani and orchestra now <laughs> Mm -hmm. actually was timpanist of the amarillo symphony for four or five seasons um and they would fly me there it's a part-time orchestra so i did a lot of timpani and i really liked assistant timpani because i feel like i could do percussion and timpani well um but um you know and you know the preparation is you know everyone treats it different and you know for me you know like I start off with really slow practice. You know, I think as I've gotten older, I, I, I emphasize the slow practice more and more. Um, and, um, you know, just a lot of recording, you know, a lot of playing, playing in, you know, the whole, the, the reason why you do mocks is just to practice, you know, um, what it's like to play in a nervous situation. Right. And it's, you know, I kind of like making mistakes and mocks because then I, I'll get really upset and annoyed because, you know, because like you want to, yeah. you know, you want to, you, you get, you get annoyed because like you want it to be so good. And it's yeah. like, I know, I know what I have to do. I know what it's supposed to sound like. And then I get so frustrated when it doesn't go well. Um, I don't know if like Matt Strauss, I don't know if Matt ever mentioned this to you, but he refers to some of those moments, you know, when things are at their toughest and you're going through it and you're, you're on the circuit and it's just nothing's going right and you're doing these mocks and you're still missing stuff and it's just rough. Mm -hmm. And he calls it being in the ditch, like, and you have yeah. to learn how to love being in the ditch. Like it's, it's, yeah, gotta, totally. it's gotta become your favorite place. And what you're talking about sounds like to me, just the enthusiasm in your voice, like, oh, dude, and then I miss stuff. It's annoying and I hate it, but I, lo <laughs> but I love it, right? You know, yeah, it because to me, like you love, you learned how to love being in the ditch. Yeah, yeah, you need to embrace that. Um, and, um, you know, I remember the, the previous audition or the last audition I took before Seattle was, was uh, NSO, the assistant principal, the one that Aaron just won. And I remember it was like, I was just cramming because I think it was Atlanta and NSO happened very close together. Mm. And it, this was earlier this year. And I remember just like cramming because there was two marimba solos. There was that Ligeti xylophone excerpt. That's just insane. Um, tons of mallets. I remember just like cramming and that's that I hate, I hate cramming yeah for notes for auditions and obviously you know for seattle you know i learned everything you know like right away you know like when that list comes out you know i'm the first thing i'm doing is learning the marimba solo and, and all the mallet excerpts i don't know and just like you know i think it's it really is being as prepared as possible and um actually this is something that that mike werner told me at music academy or he told the class was you know when you when you're playing the audition it's like like you, you need every excerpt you need to know so well it's like it's like uh like a dissertation like every excerpt it's like uh you're presenting a dissertation like like you're you know trying to do a dma and it's like that's how well you have to know everything yeah and uh and that's hard because the lists are so big and we have so many instruments and it's like you have to make sure that 
you know, all the instruments sound good. Like your tambourine sound good. Your drums sound good. That you have the right triangle, triangle beater. And, you know, you know, I mean, it's, it's so much and it, it could be so, you know, overwhelming at times. And I think that's another good thing is to not, you know, I was making sure that I wouldn't get burnt out, you know? Yeah. Cause I think that's something that happened to me in the past is that you go so hard for like two months and then by the end, you're just like, gosh, like, you know, and then that, because the music, it needs to be fresh and you, you need to sound, you know, you have to enjoy the music, obviously. And that's well, hard when you're, you know. Totally hard. Yeah, I agree. Mm -hmm. I, I, for all those gear heads out there, I'd love to hear what instruments <laughs> you brought with you to this audition. You know, it's funny, you know, I, uh, the only, I only used one snare drum and that was a four inch brass, uh, the Pearl Philharmonic four inch brass. And, um, you know, that drum sound great on, um, you know, I, I did everything on it, you yep. know, Shostakovich, you know, third moon Shahrazad, you know, Bartok concerto. Um, and then, uh, so that was my drum. Um, and then my tambourines, I just used, um, I had a left, uh, the, um, the Malacca series, the, the, uh, combination, um, I can't think of what, I think there's only one on the Dimalaka series. Okay. It's an amazing tambourine. Sounds so good. And I had like a Von Kraft, Ron Von, like the Firebird, I think it's called for the soft mm -hmm. tambourine stuff. And, and then triangle, I used use Abel, I use Abel triangle. Isn't that amazing that that triangle, I know it's still just King I triangle. Mean, it's just, it's <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> gets the job um, done dude gets the job yeah done. exactly it it's so funny um and then um castanets i use these black swamp castanets mm -hmm. uh um, that was the first time i ever had to play castanets on audition interesting um or it was ever on a list so that was interesting and uh you know mallets you know i used to use a variety you know everything so yeah. I think is that is that everything? I think that covers everything. Yeah. Did uh so. do you wrap your own bass drum beaters? I mean, did you have to play bass drum? <laughs> I did. Um I think it was just one bass drum excerpt in the in the finals was Billy Bud. Um and I just used uh it was a dragonfly, it's like the Mahler three dragonfly beater. Cool. It's a great that's a great bass drum beater. Um yeah, I'm really, I'm, I'm, I'm good doing my, my sponsors. Yeah, I was about to say, yeah, my sponsorship. If, if you're sure not you already this. sponsored by them, if you're not already sponsored by them, you're about to have a lot of sponsorships. <laughs> yeah, coming I'll drop my email. So, <laughs> <you know. laughs> um, and uh, how about symbols? Did you bring your own plates or did you use the ones provided? No, so, so they, they provide symbols. They actually, um, you know, they, they send out an instrument list and, mm -hmm. Uh, in that instrument list, they kind of, they actually say like which symbols you would use for each excerpt. So mm -hmm. it'd be like, you know, Chike 4, use the, you know, 17 inch Sabians and, and you know, Rock 2, mm -hmm. use a 16 inch. So they, uh, so you kind of had to use the symbols that they wanted you to use, um, which is good, you know, because, you know, with big orchestras, um, you know, usually their symbols are really, they sound great. And um I wish more yeah. orchestras would do that. To any people on panels yeah. who are listening to this, please do that. Please just like, just, we don't know the hall, man. We've never played at that hall. We don't know your plates. We don't know what you want to hear. Just tell us what you want. We can sound great on so many different things, you know? And I, yeah. I, th I think that that's great. I think that really probably reflects a lot of experience on Mr. Warner's part and, and understanding how to attract the right type of candidate, which clearly they did. Um, and I, I love that. I, I think I think orchestras should try to be giving as much information as they possibly can, keeping lists manageable and reasonable for those of us, as you're saying, who might have to do other positions to pay the rent, right? You don't have unlimited hours to get ready for an orchestra audition. Um, you know, time management is very important. Clearly you were, you know, you were at that sweet spot where you're like, you have all this experience, but you were still just finishing up school. So that, that makes sense, you know, it's. I think that that reflects the the nature of these percussion auditions. If you're going to go after it and you're going to go win one, you really have to 
you know, a little bit, put the blinders on and give that so much attention because you got people like John Wisner out there who are learning the entire list within the first week of it coming out, right? I mean, that's, that's the competition these days and that's what it takes and that's what you did and that's how you got this incredible, incredible gig. You know, it's, a, it's amazing. It's really a, it was a lifelong, you know, ramp to get to this Absolutely. place just and it's not it's not a it's not a straight line i mean it's a bumpy road but yeah but it really started from when you were eight you know and now we're both 30 yeah. now right you're 30 or 31 yeah actually i turned 31 tomorrow so. oh happy <laughs> birthday oh my gosh wow amazing okay yeah. cool yeah, uh, so. it's may guys it's may 20th right now may 20th okay so he's turning I know. 21 on the 21st here yeah. um that's that is really really cool dude. yeah you know and, and to go on with what you're saying you know it's it very much is it's a journey it's a path and you know everyone's path is different and um yeah you know and i think you know it you know some people it takes longer than other people and it's and, you know and you know looking back on it you know like i really wanted like last summer that Ellie Phil audition, like I really wanted that, that job, obviously, because it's a great job. And it was, it was my uh, kind of like a dream job. You know, I'm from, you know, I went to school here, I was subbing there. Uh, and then, you know, I made finals and it, and it, you know, David played amazing and he's doing a great job, obviously. And, you know, it didn't work out for me. And, and it's, it's tough. Um, you know, like I said earlier, that, that emotional commitment, it's, it's tough to, to like look forward and to like move on, you know? And, and I, I remember just telling myself, you know, this isn't going to define you. This is just like one step yeah. of the process, you know? And I didn't know, you know, I didn't know when I was going to win a job, you know, I didn't know if it was going to take, you know, a month, you know, a year, five years, but, you know, I kind of told myself, you know, you're going to, you know, you're going to pull through and you're going to do it. And it's, it's about that persistence and, um, and yeah, just, an, you know, embrace the journey, you know, yeah. because, you know, it's exciting, you know, and I think, you know, doing all these, taking all these auditions, you know, makes me appreciate this moment even more, you know, because, you know, you know, you understand how, how difficult it is and, um, and yeah, so. <laughs> Sorry, I'm, I'm getting like I, I'm, Matt, I haven't Matt read Howard the, the comment section. With, yeah, Matt Howard is chiming in with yeah, the dude. Champ. That he even had to play a Wagner rehearsal immediately after yeah, the finals. Tell that, that story, story crazy. Let's, that's a nice little so, story. So, so I remember, I remember when I accepted that, I got the email from the PM about playing um, Second Timpani on uh, Valkyrie uh, Act Three, Valkyrie, I believe. Uh, with Duda Mel and um and I remember the first rehearsal was like the day of the finals I'm like oh geez should I you know, should I do this I'm like you know and then I said you know if I if I win it obviously it's going to be awesome but if I don't you know I have a gig right so <laughs> so I took that gig and um yeah you know it you know it was definitely uh it was a tough rehearsal, I guess, you know, and, uh, <laughs> but, um, yeah, you know, the, I think those are, those are the experiences that really build character, mm. you know? And I think that, um, I remember like talking to my dad and he was like, you know, go in, like, you know, hold your head high, you know? And it's like, you know, and I, and I did, cause like making finals is still an amazing achievement and accomplishment. And, um and you know and i know they the whole section has been you know they're still my teachers and my mentors and and friends and they've been so amazing to me uh this past year and um you know it's just like that's just how auditions are you know it's just you know it's behind a screen you know there's just you know there's one you know every you know 10 you know it's just like you know, it's just the way it is. It's just the nature of our business. And, um, you know, I, you, you can't really take it personal, you know, and he's, you know, so. Yeah. I think having yeah. that healthy amount of, or I should put this a different way. 
one of the reasons it's so difficult for so many people, uh, basically for everyone, is that you have to be simultaneously really detached from the process while being extremely invested in the process, right? It's like, what? How are you supposed to do both those things? How, how is yeah. that supposed to be simultaneously happening that you're so invested and then if it went, as soon as it doesn't work out, you just say, oh, I'm completely fine with that. I'm gonna move on and do it again. You know, it, it's really, really hard. And I think one of, the, you know, there's been a number of people who've spoken on this topic really well. Um, and the things that I hear are just to, in order to mentally get over that, are just falling in love with the process, right? We hear that all the time, falling in love with the process of knowing that there's always gonna be another one. You're just trying to improve who you are, you're trying to improve your audition technique. It's not about this specific result, it's just about you know making sure that you're always improving, that lifelong learning, that lifelong improvement. But mm. it certainly stings a little more when it feels like an orchestra that you're really connected to, that you really wanted. I mean, I know the one that hurt the most for me was the Met. And I wasn't even in the finals for that. You know, it was just, <laughs> I, I made it to semis and I, and I didn't get it. And there goes all my friends and they're sitting in the finals and then Stephen White wins that job. And I was like, man, I studied next door for six years and I couldn't get in the door. You know, and it was just, I felt like such a loser. You know, I was like, you feel like a failure, just a total failure. And it's really, really hard. So there's always some, and then, you know, months after that, I get my job. Just, just a few, same thing as you, right? Just a few months later, bam, you're employed. So I think, uh, you know, sometimes dark, it's always darkest right before the dawn. That happens too, a lot. Always, you know, if you're really invested in it and you were giving 100,000% and it doesn't work out, you still got way better. It, you got way better. So I think it's okay to get really invested and to get kind of heartbroken. You know, I think sometimes that's healthy and then you're gonna be, maybe that's how you get to the detachment, I guess, is kind of what I have discovered for myself. But John, we're we're gonna wrap up here, but I'm, I'm curious, you know, um, as, as sort of a final takeaway, if you had to give one piece of advice, not an ABC, not a one, two, three, mm -hmm. but just a very singular pointed one piece of advice for advancing a percussion career. In your experience, what would that be? Wow. Um, you know, you I can, think you can take a second. You don't have to answer yeah. it away. It's, it's, a, it's a big question. It's a loaded question. So you can you can uh, unpack it. Yeah, I think. You know, I think. Um, you know, it's really important to to get along with people, you know, and I think you know, having a good attitude, you know, in every situation you're in is, is really important, you know, whether you're, you know, whether you're just subbing in an orchestra or you're, you know, you're um, in school, you know, it just, you know, just being a, a good person and, and uh, making sure that, you know, you're a person that people want to be around and being positive and, and it's, you know, like we're saying, it's hard to always be, have a, great attitude or be positive all the time you know we're all human we all go through things and but you know I think um you know just it's about believing in yourself it's about staying positive it's about always you know every day just trying to get better you know and trying to be but most importantly it's like trying to be your the best version of yourself you know and you know at the end of the day it's you know the, the most important opinion is op the opinion you have of yourself and and making sure mm -hmm. that, you know, you take care of yourself and that you're happy, you know. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I know that's very, not very specific, very broad things, but, you know, that's what's helped me and um, to keep going. And uh, yeah, it's, you know, it's, this is a really tough field, like I said, and, um, you know, but, you know, I, you know, how, how lucky am I that the thing that I love most is like my job and my career, you know, like, I think, I think that's the real blessing is that, you know, I don't know what I would do if I didn't do music, mm. you know, I mean, I don't know. And, and how lucky am I that I chose the instrument that I love, you know, I, I couldn't, I, w I would hate trumpet or, you know, clarinet, right. you know, <laughs> so, you know, how lucky am I that, 
the thing that I do every day is the thing that I'm most passionate about, you know, and, and just remembering that as you get, the later you, you move on in an audition, like, you know, when you, when you advance to semis, when you advance to finals, it's easier for, for the thoughts to go in other places. That's not the music, you know, like the night before a final round, you're laying in bed, trying to go to sleep. You're thinking about all the things that come after like winning the audition, you know, and it's just, it's, it's really hard to stay focused on the task at hand, which is the music, mm. you know? And I think for me, that was something that really um, it took, you know, this is my fourth finals. And I think, and I think I, I needed to experience multiple finals mm. to, you know, to finally, you know, stay focused. Yeah. That's really important. People talk about yeah. that in just regular everyday job interviews too. Yeah. Like a lot of job, like you, you're going to go get a, try to get a job at Google or whatever. Like there's a lot of stages. It's just, it's a lot like orchestra auditions. You know, you go in for that initial, like you just mm -hmm. got to get your resume in and then you got to go in for your initial round. And those earlier rounds in a way are a lot easier, <laughs> even though, yeah. even though they're cutting a tremendous amount of people, it's just like, you kind of just, you know, the right things to say, yeah. and da, 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 da. but those later rounds, when you're interviewing with the people who really know, they really know their stuff, it's, yeah. they become very difficult and it can feel like. You get some momentum off those first couple of rounds like, yeah, this is cool. And then all of a sudden, yeah, let's let's just sit down and talk to you about details for 45 mm -hmm. minutes, you know? Yeah. So I think that that's yeah. I mean, I would assume, yeah, it might take it might take a few tries of getting that right. You know, it's that's it's a major task. Um, uh -huh. But but, John, I'm so I'm so proud of you, dude. I hope that you're just incredibly proud of yourself. I'm, I'm just I'm happy to know you. I'm happy to call you a friend. We've been doing this together since we were like itty bitty, you know, and going through all these things together in Houston. I still remember playing silly shows with you in HYS and Dr. Webster still he's still up there conducting, man. Dr. Webster wow. still running HYS. The man just doesn't age. Incredible human. I am very, very confident that you are going to do extremely well there. And I look forward to hearing you on stage with the yeah. Seattle Symphony. Man, thank you so much, Josh. And just one last thing. I remember, so we were in high school together. And uh -oh, like I said, uh -oh, uh -oh. I, I didn't, I didn't, so I didn't get into any of the big schools, but you did. And you were, you know, I felt like I was just trying to catch up to you for, for so long. And so, man, I just want to say thank you for being you and for doing this and, you know, you do so much for our community and, um, you know, I'm looking forward to, you know, talking to you for, you know, many years to come and, uh, you know, build on our relationship, you know. I love so, that. And yeah. thank you so much for it's really nice of you to say that, John. And I would love for you to now turn off all your social media, go get tenure and wake up a year from now or <laughs> exactly. whatever it is. And, yep. uh, and when you do, and you're all settled and you're ready to teach with us, open invitation, come teach with us on percussion Thanks. conservatory. Anytime we'd love to have you as a, as a faculty member in the future. And, um, and please, 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 please keep gracing us with your gifts throughout all of percussion land. My man, I'm very, very happy for you. Great. Thank you, Josh. Yeah. Guys, have a great day. We look forward to seeing you on our next percussion story.